Hey everybody, this is Rebecca Strauss from Scuba Diver Life. I'm the editor of the site and I'm going to be here today chatting with Jason Washington, underwater photographer based in the Cayman Islands. I'm just going to give a little intro on Jason before we invite him into the broadcast. Uh, and this is our first time doing this, so bear with us if we have any technical difficulties. Um, all right, for the past two decades, Jason Washington has been a leader in the Cayman Islands water sports community. A 2017 International Scuba Diving Hall of Fame honoree, his focus both locally and abroad has been on protecting the delicate marine life of the Cayman Islands through underwater photography. You can see his iconic style of ambient light photography both digitally and in print all over the world, including in the iconic Nat Geo. So without further ado, let's add Jason to the broadcast and get started. Hey, hey Jason, you're... how's it going? Fantastic, how are you? Hello, Facebook world. And where are you right now, Jason? You're in Cayman Islands, right? I'm on Grand Cayman, currently in lockdown. Yeah, how's it going there? Well, it's it's a little bit crazy, but I think we're handling it well. I think the toughest part for me right now is I'm only steps away from some of my favorite dive sites, and I'm stuck in the house. So, hey. Oh, so everything is completely shut down, right? Everything's completely shut down. And I'm just seeing some people coming into the room now. I'd just like to say hi to, hey, Errol, what's going on? Uh, Carrie, what's up, man? Coral. Coral <laughs> the model in the presentation is on board today. Cool. All right, Jason, do you want to get your screen set up to share with us so that we can see your presentation? Jason's going to do about a half an hour chat with us. I'm going to field questions. I have We have some questions to ask him. And then if you all have questions, go ahead and add them to the stream. And then I will ask Jason the questions for you and make sure that uh, you guys get all of your uh, photography questions answered. I'm just so, gonna wait. Okay, here we go. Can you see my screen? Yep. Are you are you ready to go, Jason? Should we start the PowerPoint? I'm sitting on go. All right, let's do it. Manu, what's up, man? It's been a long time. Let's Thank get you. Get rid of this and do this. Okay. Go ahead, Jason. We can see your first screen if you want to get started, and then I will just uh, let you know if there's any questions coming in for you as you're talking. All right, here we go, guys. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank everybody for um, coming out today. I'd like to thank Cressy for uh, giving me this time to talk to you lovely individuals out there about one of my most favorite topics in the world, underwater photography. So when Cressy reached out to me to do this presentation today, um, I really wanted to put a lot of thought into how I could bring value to you guys. And I think the best way for me to do that is to just go back to basics and talk about some techniques that I use to create the sort of style of photography that I shoot. And I'd like to start with probably the, the thing that I use the most, which is a, as a uh, custom white balance. Now, if you were to put me in a box, it would probably be close focus ambient light wide angle. So I want to start with white balance today, talk you guys through what is a custom white balance? How do we use it underwater? Why is it necessary? So the cameras that we shoot are designed for air, they're designed for land, they're not designed to go underwater. We have changing light conditions underwater that we don't currently have in the air, so we have to tell the camera how to operate underwater. So we do that, uh, one, of the, one of the ways we do that is through a custom light balance. And the way we do that, guys, is, uh, let, me, let, me, let me try to land this plane. So as we descend through the water column, we start to lose light. That light sort of starts to affect the reds, the yellows, the oranges, and then the deeper we go, the less light there is. So what we have to do is we have to tell our camera, hey, what is white at this depth? And we do that by simply carrying down a white slate. Now, this is a slate that you can pick up at any old dive shop. I keep it attached to my BCD um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the dive. And then when I'm ready to go, I just hold the white slate up. Um, can you see me in the image? Can you see the slate? No, we can just see the, uh, here, we'll go like this. And then I think now everybody can see you. Your slide is on the right here. And then now we can see you holding up the slate. Okay. So the way we do this, guys, is we take the slate down to depth. And then we find our light source, which is going to be our sun. So as the sun illuminates the white slate, what we do is we take an image of the slate. Then we go into our auto white balance or our uh, sorry, custom white balance settings. And we tell the camera this is white at that depth. Then it's able to base its 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 color uh, algorithm off the white slate, and it knows what color red is, what color blue is, what color orange is, what color yellow is, and that's how we do that. Now, I get a lot of questions as well when people say, hey, why can't I just shoot in raw and fix it in post? Well, you can shoot in raw and fix it in post, but I would just caution you that if the color data is not in the image, 
then you don't have anything to manipulate in raw and post. So a good example of that is if you were to say shoot something that's red from 30 or 40 feet away with ambient light, your camera's going to see that as black. And until you do a custom light balance, those, that color data is not going to be in there. So there's going to be no latitude in post to actually fix or, or recreate that. Now, there are other reasons why we shoot a custom light balance. And um, <clears throat> this is an image of Coral, who's on the call today. Coral is a very close friend of mine and happens to be one of the best uh, freediving models on planet Earth today. So mm. very happy to uh, have her as a neighbor down here in the Mountains. Um, if you look at this image, you'll notice straight away that uh, her skin tones are very natural. You'll also look at the image and notice that the color goes from the bow all the way back to the wheelhouse of this, of this shipwreck. Now, if you were to shoot this with strobe photography, basically what you would get would be um, a colored foreground, and then the background would be blue or monochromatic. It's just not achievable with strobe photography. So we need a custom light balance to sort of get this style of imagery um, throughout the image. So this is another reason why it's very important to shoot a custom light balance, especially when you're shooting big wrecks. Now my third tip here is gonna be shooting manual camera settings. You should never allow your camera to make decisions. You wanna tell it everything you want it to do underwater because again, that camera is designed to shoot in the air and has no idea that it's underwater. Hey Jason. So, yes. I have a question about white balance. Here. Can we create a custom white balance with a GoPro? Unfortunately, you can't create a custom white balance with a GoPro. Um, for a GoPro, you're gonna to have to either shoot a video light or a continu or continuous lighting or a filtered light. Um, now, what you can do with a GoPro is you can shoot it in RAW or ProTune, which will give you more latitude in post, but unfortunately, um, with a GoPro, you're not gonna be able to shoot a custom white balance. Okay, all right. So. Back to manual camera settings. Um, the thing here, guys, is you don't want the camera to make too many decisions on its own because it doesn't know that it's underwater. So you want to basically tell it everything to do. So that's going to be your aperture, your shutter speed. You got to tell it what kind of light you're shooting. Is it ambient light? Is it flash photography? Is it continuous lighting? You have to give it all this information, but there are a few settings in your camera that you can allow it to, to make. And the first one is going to be autofocus. So you have a few different types of autofocus on modern camera systems. You've got zone focusing, you've got spot focusing, and then you've got facial tracking. Now, I, I prefer the spot focusing, and let me tell you why. If, you have, if you're shooting a model or a fish or a critter underwater, um, you want to make sure that their eyes are sharp. So if you put a zone focus on, then it can pick up any part of that fish or any part of the human and focus tightly on that, but the eyes might not be sharp. So what I like to do is shoot single, single focus uh, pointing right on the eye of my model, whether it's my a, a fish or a, uh, a free diver. I want to put that single dot right on their face. Now the facial tracking is great for video. It's not great for stills. Uh, the other uh, decision that we let the cameras make underwater when we're shooting wide, ang wide angle ambient light photography, not flash photography, not video, is auto ISO. So auto ISO is basically trying to balance out your light meter all the time. So my jumping off points from my Canon 5D Mark IV on a daily basis are gonna be 1 1 25th of a second, F11, and auto ISO. So let me tell you why. So I've got a turtle swimming this way. Let's say the sun is behind it, so it's very bright. So at F11 and 1 1 25th, I'm good, right? I'm shooting into this bright scene. My ISO is gonna be somewhere around 100. But as that turtle passes me, I'm going to be able to turn and then shoot with the sun over my shoulder as it's passing me and not change any settings in the camera because what's happening now is my auto ISO has probably jumped up to three or 400, which is still very okay and, and still going to make a great image. But I didn't have to change any settings in my camera. Um, you know, we've got such a limited time underwater and these, these beautiful moments happen in an instant. So we want to be ready and we don't want to be fiddling with our cameras all the time. We just want to shoot the image. And auto, auto ISO in that scenario will help me achieve that goal. Um, I have a question. Shoot. What lens do you recommend for wide angle photography? So I'm a huge proponent of fisheye lenses. I'm a Canon guy and my favorite or my go-to lens is my 815L. And this is that lens on my Canon 5D Mark IV. 
But I also had a Sony A7R4, which was provided to me recently by CNC. And you can see that even on this camera, I'm shooting the same lens. Even though it's a Canon lens on a Sony, I have an adapter um, for this. But this is absolutely the best lens on the market. Um, it's 8 to 15. So I can shoot at 8 in a spherical image or back it out to 15 for my wide angle shots. Okay. All right, guys, back into it here. I'm going to talk about understanding light and, and why this is important under light. Well, light, firstly, we need it for photography. We can't take a picture without, without having any light. But what we're trying to do um, is trying to mimic or recreate Mother Nature's ambient light. If you're on the, uh, on the set of a movie, uh, on the set of a TV show, you got guys around with millions of dollars worth of lighting systems. And all they're trying to do with these LED lights or whatever type of light it is, they're just trying to recreate ambient light. So um, underwater, that's, we don't have those tools. We have to use that ambient light. We, you can't bounce light underwater. I suppose you could, but it'd be very difficult. Um, you can add in fill light, but it never looks as good as ambient light. So I always like to use ambient light. It's always going to be my first option. Now, one of the tricks that I like to use, and I love this image of Coral here, um, standing in this light. One of the tricks that I like to use is shooting from the shadow into the light. And that's what I'm doing in this image here. I've got Coral at about 45 feet in this tunnel. And as you can see, she's standing right in that light column. Now, what you don't see is that I'm removed from the light column. And I'm actually back in the shadow shooting into the light. That helps me build light contrast. Now, if you don't have that option, you can always create a shadow. And I do this often as well. And this is a little trick that, that um, I use wherever I go. Jason, we have, a, we have a couple questions. We've got one from Jerome Yost, I think. Uh, he says, on the auto ISO, how high do you go maximum? Jerome, it's going to depend on your camera system. Um, on my Canon 5D Mark IV, I'm pretty happy with keeping it under 2,000. Having said that, I prefer to keep it as low as possible or in, in, at its native ISO. So if I can shoot it at 100, I will stay at 100 always and adjust my shutter speed and aperture to keep it there. Um, on my Sony a7R4, um, the native ISO is 50. Um, I'll try to keep it at 50. But... The maximum end is really going to depend on your camera because the higher you get up, the, more, the, the noisier your image is going to get. But I would think that with most modern DSLRs and most modern mirrorless rigs right now, I think anything below 2,000 would probably, probably be acceptable. Cool. And then what type of strobes do you shoot? Right now, I'm shooting uh, CNC YSD2 strobes. They're very powerful. They've got a guide rating of 32, and uh, they've got a very fast recycle rate. They also work on rechargeable AA batteries, which is, I think is important because you don't have that internal battery that's you have to recharge over and over again. And when it fails, the strobe is dead. I like the ones where you can put the batteries in. Cool. All okay. right. So back to it. Um, shooting into the shadow. You can see here I've got coral underneath the boat. And I'm using that shadow beneath the dive boat on this image to create light contrast. And she can swim into it, into the shadow. <clears throat> Excuse me. She can swim out of the shadow. Um, I'm able to manipulate the scene and create light contrast because I have a shadow there. Now, this was on a recent trip. This image was shot on a recent trip to uh, Bimini. This was at Neil Watson's Scuba Center. So shout out to Neil and his crew over there. They did a really great job. We went there to go free diving to film hammerheads and tiger sharks. And when you look at this image, you can see that it's very shallow there. It's about 25 feet, so it's great for shallow free diving and it is absolutely a washing shark so i would highly recommend it to anybody who ever get a chance to go there it's a it's just a great place to uh to shoot big sharks we got a couple questions we got a couple related questions first okay. uh would you recommend glass dome ports or acrylic well that will really depend on what type what style of photography you're doing um i have both so glass ports work better when you're shooting up into the sun there's less ghosting and artifacts in your imagery they're a little bit heavier, so I don't like the glass port when I'm free diving. I, I prefer the acrylic port because it's so much lighter. Um, the other downside of a glass port is if you scratch it, you've got to send the thing away to get it fixed. Uh, with a acrylic port, you can just polish it out at home. Oh, cool. Okay, and then we have a question from Keone Drew. 
Uh, um, it's my experience that shooting ambient is maybe a little easier with great visibility, but what is your suggestion when shooting in slightly lower than ideal water vis to get clear shots and what settings do you think would work the best? I think that when it comes to, um, to low visibility water, uh, green water, I think really understanding your editor um, is key. When you, when you, especially when you talk about ambient light shots. Um, whenever you shoot uh, stroke photography in an area where you have low visibility or challenging uh, environmental conditions, those strobe, the, the strobe flash is going to pick up the loose particulate in the water and it's gonna illuminate it and it's gonna make a lot of backscattering in the image. So ambient light is probably a better option for you, but back to understanding your editor, um, if, if you're five, six feet from your subject, you've got five or six feet of color between you and your subject. You need to be able to identify that color in your editor and then desaturate that color. Um, a good example of that is maybe the image that we're looking at right now of this tiger shark. Um, uh, there's an aqua hue that I removed in that. It made the tiger shark's belly nice and bright white, it made the sand nice and bright white. So even doing a custom white balance for me in this beautiful clear blue water isn't the end all be all. I, I also have to manipulate it a little bit in post and we'll get into that here in a moment. Okay, but, Victor has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, were you, were you done? Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. Victor has a question. In case of low light conditions like caves, when the speed is already set slow, what is better to set to sacrifice? Uh, what is better to sacrifice? Aperture, ISO, or a bit of both? So, you know, we have this we have this rule that I loosely adhere to. It's called the 180 degree shutter rule, and it basically means you want to double your frame rate with your shutter speed. Um, I don't necessarily always adhere to that. So, what I would say to you is, I would get in that low light environment. I would set my ISO as low as I could, um, then I would open my lens all the way up. So for instance, my Canon 815 is an F4 lens. I would put that lens at F4, drop my shutter down to about 1 60th of a second, and then slowly raise my ISO until I got the composition that I wanted. Um, so I think that open your shutter up, or I'm sorry, open your lens up, slow your shutter, and then go to ISO as a last ditch uh, effort. Okay, so I just want to make a point about creating a shadow, and this slide, I think, really well represents what I'm trying to, to speak to here. So this is in Bimini. It's about 25 feet of water, and as you look out across this image, you see a shark, you see a boat, you see light rays and a shadow cast on the sea floor, and you see this beautiful white sand. Now, if that boat were not there, every image that I shoot in this white sandy field, it's very samey. There's no light contrast. It's just well-lit sharks. And that gets a little bit boring. So the trick that I did here was I asked the crew over at Neil Watson's, I said, listen, we're going to be free diving with the sharks today. I would like it if we could put out two anchors. So on this boat, we put out a bow anchor and a stern anchor. That way we fix the boat so it doesn't move. And it casts this fixed shadow straight underneath the boat. So then what I had the guys do was I had them put the bait station in the shadow. And that way I knew those sharks were swimming out of that shadow all day. And it gave us an opportunity to create light contrast in, in an area where there would otherwise be zero light contrast. So that's a good trick that you can use there, guys. Now, how long can you hold your breath when you're doing like free diving uh, photography? So <laughs> there's a, there are a few different ways to measure that. Uh, you can, there's a static breath hold where you lay flat and you don't swim around. And I'm just under six minutes there for a static breath hold. Ooh. But on, on a swimming dive, you know, a good two and a half minute swim is probably near my limit. Um, if I'm on the scooter, it's somewhere in between the two things. So, you know, a couple minutes, a couple good minutes swimming. Okay. So, guys, I want to talk a little bit about equipment as well and knowing your equipment and understanding if you have the right equipment for the job. Now, a good example of this is if I were to go, if, if Cressy were to ask me to shoot a piece of equipment for them. Well, when they manufacture this gear, it has a very distinct color code on it. So, if it's 000.1496432 red, and I need to recreate that red, I'm probably going to have to add artificial light to make that red come out as poppy as it should be, or as poppy as the brand wants it to be. And if I'm trying to achieve that look with a GoPro, it's just never going to happen. Um, to, to achieve that kind of look, I'm going to have to fire an external strobe. And you can't sync a strobe to a GoPro. So you need to understand the limitations of your gear and understand do I have, you have to ask yourself the question, do I have the right gear to, to create the situation that I'm looking for? 
Also, you guys need to be able to shoot your cameras in manual mode. And I, and I know that most of you probably already do this, but remember, we're going back to the basics here. So understanding how to shoot your camera in manual top side is key to being a great underwater photographer. I'll give you an example. If you go to spend, if you spend 4,000 bucks and you go to Tiger Beach and you've got your, all your kits set up and, and, and you've been waiting all year to do this and get these amazing tiger shark images and you drop down and the tiger shark firstly swims over the top of your head and you take a shot and, it, and you look in your LCD and you go, oh, this is not what I was hoping for. This is not the image I was hoping for. If you shot your camera in manual mode all the time, you would know it exactly how to fix that. So maybe you look down and you go, oh, there's motion blur. Adjust my shutter speed up. And then click, 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 and you're back in the game. So you're troubleshooting real time underwater because you shoot your camera in tops in manual mode topside. And when I say shoot it in manual mode topside, I mean adjust your aperture, adjust your shutter speed, adjust your ISO, adjust everything for every shot. And then that way when you get underwater, if you do run into that situation, you're not going to have a scenario where you don't know how to fix it. And the third thing I would say to do, guys, is to dive your gear. And, you know, I know you're not all as fortunate as, as me to be able to step out your back door and be on the record of Kitty Wake or on some amazing north wall dive in the Cayman Islands. But what you can do, and what I would highly recommend you all do, go into your child's closet, get six, five or six of the most colorful toys you can find, and then take those toys into a local swimming pool, um, maybe your neighbor's pool outside, maybe the local pool at the YMCA, and take your continuous lighting, take your strobe, take your strobe lights, um, shoot ambient light at these toys until you can get them to, to put out, produce the color that you see that you know that they should be. And do that in different scenarios. So the, the, the light in your, in your pool is going to be different than the light at the YMCA because the light at the YMCA is going to be tungsten or fluorescent light and it's going to have a different color on those toys versus your outdoor pool shoot it at night these are all things that you can do uh, in preparation uh, for your next dive trip jason we've got a question from errol hello from germany question i use a sony a7r3 and the watercolor is always kind of purple like it probably is with your sony r4 what do you do to get the watercolor to that nice blue in your pictures what do you do in post so yeah, so the color science in Sony has not quite made it to the to the Canon line. So my Canon 5D Mark IV, which is pretty much my main camera, this is this is the new camera that was sent to me by CNC. Do you want to show it a little bit closer to the camera? These are both. Yeah, there we go. Yep. These are both great cameras. Um, you you drilled it. You nailed it right on the head. Um, Sony, as well as Nikon, I feel like. Put out an overly magenta uh, blue file, blue color. I think Canon has the best color science. But um, what you're going to want to do is get a really good editor. If you're talking about um, uh, Photoshop and shooting stills and removing that magenta, typically what I'll do for my Sony files is I will push the blue slider a little bit more to the blue and then push the magenta slider all the way to blue. And that will pretty much fix it. Sometimes I'll also remove the aquas on my Sony files. I always remove the aquas on my uh, Canon files. But again, just push this, the blue slider a little bit to the blue and then the magenta slider all the way to blue. And that's going to help you. Now, if it comes to, when it comes to video files, that's a little bit trickier. Um, I have a plugin in Final Cut Pro called Color Finale. And um, I'm able to do something very similar to the file, to, the, to a video file that I would do to a still file using color canal. So I hope that helps. Cool. Okay. Uh, free diving experience. I think this is a tool that all underwater photographers should have in their toolbox. Now we're here on the Cressy page today. Cressy is a global leader in the free diving industry and I'm super stoked to represent this brand and free diving for me is uh, something I'm very passionate about. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with me, you might not know that I've been a professional diver my entire adult life. I've never done anything else. Um, I've been a working uh, dive instructor in the Cayman Islands since, uh, since my early 20s. And um, it's something that I've always been passionate about, scuba diving. But free diving has also been in the background of my, of my entire adult life. And the one great thing I can tell you about free diving, especially when it comes to big shark photography, is there's no better way to do it. Because mm. when you're free diving with these big animals, they look at you as if you're one of them. So they come right up to you. Now, if you're underwater on scuba with the big sharks, 
They don't like it. They don't like the bubbles. They don't like the noisy. It's odd to them, and they don't want to come around. Um, if any of you have ever been on a guided shark dive, uh, you'll know that typically they'll put 15 or 20 people in the water. They make like sort of a semicircle, and the sharks swim around the group. Well, as an underwater photographer, I, I don't like that because I've got bubbles in my images. I've got other divers in my images. When I'm free diving, I'm able to get down, separate the shark from the group. Uh, the imagery is just a lot better. It's also a whole lot easier to travel with free diving uh, gear than it is for scuba gear. You know, you don't have to carry all that equipment with you. Um, now, this next slide is is about communication in free diving, and this is a this is something that I do a lot. Again, this is uh, my friend Coral Tomasic. She's uh, Coral K on Instagram. Make sure you follow her. She's an amazing model. Um, this is me and Coral shooting on the Kitty Way, and um, what I wanted to explain to you guys here is. If I try to get these shots on scuba, then basically what I have to do is we have to get together in the beginning. We have to have a conversation about what it is that we're going to do. I have to drop down on scuba. It's about 65 feet to the bottom. Here. She swims down. I take a shot. She swims up. She swims down. I take a shot. She swims up. During this process, it's likely that I will discover another angle. Maybe light conditions have changed. Maybe um, I've seen something different. So now I'm going to have to ascend to the surface on scuba, have a conversation make an adjustment, drop back down on scuba, and then start this process over again. And it might be that I need to do this on several occasions. Well, we do a lot of diving down here, and I'm not a huge fan of multiple ascents. I do a lot of scuba diving. Um, so I'd rather just do this on free diving. And the difference is, if we dive down together, we can take the shot, come up, have a conversation, make an adjustment, dive down, take a shot, ascend, have a conversation, make an adjustment, so I'm way more efficient free diving uh, than I am on scuba, and it's really my preferred way to shoot these days. Jason Liz has a question: What type of fins are you using for free diving, scuba slash scuba diving while you're shooting? Is there a preference for what you like to use while shooting and why? Yeah, I mean, so I use my Cressy carbon fibers um, free diving fins. Uh, they're great uh, long blade fins. They're about a medium stiffness. Um, definitely want a long bladed fin when you're whether you're scuba diving or free diving, I'm a big proponent of large fins. So um, definitely get yourself a large fin. You don't want to be, you know, and especially when you're free diving, because even the even the new mirrorless rigs are pretty big when you put them in the housing. And when you put a wide angle dome port on that thing, and uh, maybe you're shooting strokes, maybe you're not. It's a lot to push through the water. So I'd recommend a, a strong uh, uh, free diving blade. And um, the blades, that, again, the blades that I use are the older uh, pressing carbon fibers. Cool. Now, this is a question that I get a lot from a lot of people, and I don't think people use this term sort of correctly. People ask me, do I Photoshop my images? Well, I'll tell you guys a huge secret here today. Yes, I Photoshop every one of them. Um, and I ha you, you have to. Uh, if, you're, if you're a working photographer, you're shooting in RAW. My Sony camera shoots a .arw file. Nikon shoot a .nef file. My Canon shots a, shoots a .cr2 file. These files are not legible by normal programs. You have to have a, a photo processing editor to read these raw images. And when they come out of the camera, they're kind of flat. So you have to, um, to post-process these images, guys. So um, here's a great image of a friend of mine, Steph, uh, again, you can tell by uh, all these slides that I'm using, I like this red dive. It's in my backyard. So Sounds uh, like you got a rooster in your backyard, too. Can you get, Can you hear that chicken? I've got oh, about, yeah. I've got Somebody about, wants to join the presentation, I think. I've got about 10 of them. So. <laughs> but um, but um, this is Steph. We're standing on the kitty wake. She's about 40 feet from me, and um, she's wearing a, a nice bright red dress. So this goes back to Errol's question about, about editing. And... I'd tell you to do the same thing um, with the Sony file, but kind of this one. Basically, I, remo I removed the hue that I didn't want in the image, revealing a very clear wreck and a very red dress. So the image that you can see that's straight out of the camera, um, what I did there is I just slid the aqua slider over and then desaturated that entire color. I brought the reds up a little bit, but I didn't add any red to this image file. This is just a custom white balance. It's kind of a cloudy day. But it just goes to show you how powerful that custom white balance is and how powerful a raw file is when the color data is in the image, you're actually able to bring it up and manipulate it. Now, this file 
is what I think when people think about Photoshop. Um, this is a this is a shoot that we did earlier, or sorry, later last year, uh, earlier last year, for the Dream and Cayman uh, Department of Tourism uh, campaign. This is just a midwater model shot, and uh, as you can see, it's just nice blue water, free diving model. That was it. There's nothing else in this image. All these turtles uh, were from a file on my computer, a stock file that I, you know, I just keep different images in. And the editor added in all that in post. They added in the reef below in post. This is a composite image. And I think when people talk about Photoshop files, this is the type of Photoshop that they have in their head. When you open a file in Photoshop, technically it's Photoshopped, but this comp composite is a different style of photography. I'm not against composite photos. I'd just rather shoot them as naturally as I can without having to add in any post composition, if that makes sense. So my next trick, guys, I shoot almost everything in high speed continuous. Um, this is important and it gets a little bit nuanced here. Um, when you have a turtle swimming through the water, you've got flicker position, you've got eyes looking out, looking at the diver, checking out your camera. He's got a head position that's constantly turning. If I'm shooting a, a free diving model, the hair is sort of flowing one way, the hands and the body position are one way, uh, the fins or maybe the branding on the fin, maybe I need that in the image. If I shoot, you know, slowly, click, 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 I'm not gonna get all of those different nuanced positions. So high speed continuous is, is a setting that I'm always shooting in. My, um, my uh, Canon 5D Mark IV shoots about seven frames a second. The uh, Sony A7R IV is somewhere similar to that, depending on what cards I have in it. And I'll show you guys a, a good example of why I like to do this. Um, this, is an, this is an image of a turtle that lives on the wreck of the Oro Verde off Seven Mile Beach. And I love this little turtle. He's very curious and I can find him, find this little guy on almost every day, almost every dive. And on this day, this little turtle made its way up to my dome port. I think that he can see his reflection in the dome port, so he's just sort of checking himself out. But all of these images in this image stream are, um, they represent about three seconds worth of me taking images. I probably shot about 1,500 images of this little turtle. But my point is, is if you look at each individual image, one is slightly different than the next, just ever so slightly different than the next. So I chose the one with a circle around it because it's the perfect image for me. It's exactly what I was looking at. Now, had I only taken 10 images of this turtle, I would have 10 different poses to choose from, and that's just not acceptable. I want, I would rather choose the best image of a thousand images than the best image of 10 images. So I'm constantly shooting in high speed continuous. We got a couple questions. Shoot. So first from, uh, this is one about white balance from Keone. For your custom white balance, do you find yourself having to adjust this constantly based on the depth, angle, and composition of your photos? Say, I'm sorry, you kind of broke up. For, sorry, for your custom white balance, do you find that you have to adjust constantly based on the depth, angle, and composition of the photo? So absolutely. Um, so I would say that you should adjust every about every 10 feet of depth. Um, my Canon uh, will get an accurate custom white balance down to about 70 feet. And if I get a good one at 70 feet and I'm diving to 100 feet, I won't change it beyond 70 feet. I'll fix it in post. Um, but I would say, you know, about every 10 feet, change your white balance. Also, if the sun comes over, if you shot your white balance in a cloudy uh, sky and the sun comes out, change your white balance. If you shot your custom white balance in the sun and a cloud comes over, you have to change your white balance. Um, you need to constantly change it. It's even more important to change it when you're shooting video than it is when you're shooting stills because, it, again, because you're shooting in raw, you're able to fix that in post. It's not, you don't have so much latitude shooting um, um, whatever video file format your camera shoots. Um, so, okay, yes. And, we, and we've got one more. Uh, can you shoot flash photography in high-speed continuous? So you can shoot flash photography in high-speed continuous if – you turn your strobes down. So you can't shoot them TTL and you can't shoot them in a high power mode. But what you can do is, and this is a neat little trick, is you can uh, take, your, uh, take your strobes, take your white card, set it in the sand about how far away your, your target is going to be, your subject's going to be. So maybe three feet away, light it with the sunlight, and then shoot your strobes at it. 
and then go into your custom white balance settings and tell your camera this is white with the combination of sunlight and that low power strobe. And what you'll get, especially with my CNC YSD2s, if, I, if I'm shooting them on a two or three, like a, a really low power setting, I can get about 30 or 40 flashes out of them in high speed continuous. It's very impressive. Um, but you're going to want to balance the light. Otherwise, it's not going to make sense to your camera sensor. Um, also, you're not going to get that dark background look that you typically get with strobe photography with that high shutter speed. That's a powerful flash. So it's going to have a different effect, but yes, you can shoot them in high-speed continuous. Okay, guys, we're going to go on to uh, composition. And um, basically, there are two ways to think about composition as an underwater photography. You either create it or you find it. It happens in front of you. And um, oftentimes, especially when I'm diving with coral, um, we like to have a discussion about what it is that we're trying to achieve on the dive. So this image that we're showing you today represents one of those fun little images. And we talked about it. This is about a 50 foot dive down. So she, coral swims down. She gets vertical, I'm sorry, horizontal to the sand or parallel to the sand. And then we flip it up on its side. So this is just a fun way of, of, of uh, composing an image. And I would, just encourage you guys to find a photographer that inspires you. Do a hashtag search on Instagram, uh, Google search. Just find something that, that you know, kind of floats your boat. And then try to make it your own. Don't try to recreate it, but try to put your own spin on it. And the composition is oftentimes the most fun portion of the dive is trying to create that very difficult thing. Now, the other part, you know, you have to wait on it. And this image that I'm showing you now is a good example of that. This is um, a shot in the Georgetown Harbor of silver sides. They're actually called dwarf herring. But once a year, we get this massive aggregation of these little polarizing fish that they fill up the wrecks, the reefs, the overhangs, um, all the dark areas. They get filled with these silver sides. And of course, the tarpon and the jacks and everything else, they come in there to eat them. But because they're a polarizing fish, which means they all move together at the same time, as the tarpon and the other predatory fish swim through them, sometimes it creates this perfectly little round circle. And that's a good example of waiting for a composition to unfold in front of you. Um, it's not always like this. I really like this picture. The tarpon's just in the right spot. It's right. The light's perfect. Um, the fish all parted the path and created this perfectly little nice little round ball. So that's a good fun way of, of or, or a, a good way of explaining how composition sometimes just unfolds in front of you. Now, another thing that I like to, to incorporate into my composition is the sun, and I shoot up into the sun a lot, and if you follow my imagery, you'll notice that this is a thing that I do often. And um, you've got basically three elements in this image. You've got the sunlight with the rays streaming down from above. You've got the beautiful blue water, and then you've got a turtle. Well, any one of those things are kind of just boring on their own, but when you put them all together, it makes for a very interesting image. If, you know, if, if we had this image without the turtle, I'm sorry, without the sun rays, it's just an ascending turtle. Well, it wouldn't be very interesting to me. So I love to add, to use the sunlight as an added layer of composition in the image. Um, you can also see in this image, if you look really closely, you'll see the zoom ring on my camera. Um, it's reflected in the dome port. And that's this ring right here. Um, not a whole lot you can do about it. You just have to sort of accept it. I can tell you that um, my glass port has less of this than my acrylic port. So... Um, if you do have a glass port shooting up in the sun, um, it's going to help you with uh, help, help you keep some of that some of those artifacts out of your image. So, next tip, guys: finding your focal point for over unders. Um, this is pretty important, and a lot of people ask me about over under shots and how to best achieve them. But firstly, you're going to have to have a dome port. You can use a, and you need a, a you really need a big dome port. You can use a mini port if the water is really flat, but I find that an eight inch dome port or larger is a better way to do it. My acrylic port is eight inches. My CNC glass port is 9.8 inches. And it's a better option for over under photography. Now, the point I wanted to make here, make here on this slide, guys, is you need to decide where's your, where's your subject. Um, this is pretty easy for me. This is a shark, it's underwater, so I wanna make sure that my focal point is on the shark. So basically all you do is you go into your focal settings and then choose the area where your subject's going to be. Again, the shark is underwater, so I wanted to put the single dot, which is typically I keep it right in the center of the screen. I put it on the lowest part, and that allows me to get a lot of glass out of the water while still keeping my focal point underwater so I can capture the shark as it swims through the sink. 
And as you can see, this was not a flat day. This was in Cat Island in the Bahamas. And that oceanic white tip was uh, not cooperating. Mm -hmm. So it was a difficult shot to get. And you can see the sea rolling through there. It's not the most ideal, air, ideal conditions for an over-under. But because I put my focal point on the bottom, I was able to grab it. Now, the reverse side of that is if I was shooting a model and uh, there, half the body's underwater, half is up top, I want to use that top focal point and put it on the model's eyes. That's going to give me the best, um, the sharpest eyes, and that's what I'm always looking for in an image. Now, you also notice in this image that this is a landscape photo. I prefer doing over-unders in landscape. Um, it's just a lot easier. When you go into a portrait mode with a wide-angle fisheye lens, if, if your subject is too close, you're going to have a lot of distortion at the top and the bottom of the image. So uh, just a quick tip there, shooting landscape over images is always going to be an easier. Oh, 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 oh. Are you getting an echo, Jason? I don't hear it. I don't hear it. Okay. Uh, Keone's got another question. What is your best technique to avoid water lines? Well, I don't use um, any of the chemicals that some people use. I know that I know a lot of people use pledge. Like it's like a lemon oil furniture polish on acrylic quartz. I don't use that. I think the best option for you is just to make sure you have a very squeaky clean port. I use a, a product called Novus, and Novus is a is a polishing product for my acrylic port. And I know that if I polish my port before I do over unders, the water slides off of it very easily. But I don't use Rain X or any of those other products. And as a matter of fact, I think that the manufacturers suggest that you don't use those products on your acrylic ports. I'm not sure. But um, I don't use any products aside from keeping a very clean port. Okay. And Ed's got a question. Are you planning on doing more of your YouTube The Way I See It videos? And will this stream be available offline? Um, that is a very good question. I hope it is. Um, I think it will be. We can ask the folks at Pressy uh, to, to make that available. But, yes, we are working on episodes of uh, The Way I See It. Um, the next one coming out is a review of this camera. Um, we were almost finished with the review, and then we got locked down. Mm -hmm. So um, AR74 review soon come. Okay, next slide, guys. Environmental conditions and time of day. Um, oftentimes, uh, we are sort of led to believe as photographers that um, high noon is We've always been, people have always, always said, yeah, you want to go at high noon, it's the best light. I think high noon is the worst light. It's, um, everything's lit. I like low light, in this, low light in the skies, in the mornings and the afternoons. Um, this slide that I wanted to show you now is a perfect example of environmental conditions and, and utilizing the time of day to capture an image. This is another image of Coral, uh, myself and Coral and uh, one of my guys, Carl, uh, Carl Liverpool. Uh, recently went to Florida to shoot a show on bull sharks. But we had an extra day while we were there, so I called up my friend Amanda, um, Amanda Smurge up in North Florida, and I said, Amanda, where are some really wicked freediving places where we could go to get some crazy light rays? So she pointed us to this place in North Florida called Pitcher Tutton Springs. And um, it was about a five hour drive from where we were staying. So we got up super early, jumped in the car, Got a speeding ticket on the way up to try to catch this perfect time of day. And environmental conditions and time of day dictate when you shoot in this area because it's a small hole and then there's a freshwater river running beneath it. So you've got this crazy current, but you've got this light that only comes in when it's right at the top of the hole. So at 10 a.m., the hole is dark. At 2 p.m., the hole is dark. But at 12 noon, when the light's coming straight down, you get these beautiful light rays that stream down into the cavern and illuminate the, the, the floor of this beautiful cave. And it's a really beautiful, contrasting light. So um, we utilize different times of day for different types of photography. Jason? My, yes. We've got a question from Captain Lance. How do you deal with IR intrusion when shooting into the sun? Um, I expected something super technical from that guy because uh, <laughs> Me and Lance go back a long way. Thanks, Lance. I appreciate that super technical question. Um, my, uh, my, I, I would just say that uh, when I'm shooting up into the sun, the only option that I have to mitigate any sort of uh, influence from ghosting or, or any other issues is to shoot is to shoot my glass port. The acrylic port, um, 
One thing about acrylic, guys, is if you, if you point it up into the sun, you're going to see any sort of inclusion that's in the port, any sort of scratch. So it's very easy to scratch. Glass is a little bit more difficult to scratch. So shooting up into the sun is definitely for my glass port. But thanks, Lance. Appreciate it. Um, so early morning light, um, the golden hour. You know, you hear about the golden hour from still photography from topside, but it's also applicable under water. And my favorite times of day to shoot are going to be early morning uh, when the light's low in the sky, you can see this in this image. You can see this hawksbill cruising across the top of this reef. Just a nice, chill ambient light shot. The sun kisses the top of his shell, illuminating the, his back. It's just a beautiful, peaceful shot. We do the same thing in the late afternoon. Um, when the sun's super low in the sky, you know, we oftentimes go out to Stingray City Sandbar for the sunset, and we shoot, you know, stingrays. This is an image of coral again with the, with the southern stingrays here. And you see those light rays. When the, when the light's low in the sky, as the light hits the surface of the water, it bends over into the water, and it creates these crazy dense light rays. And they have different amber hues and different colors. Um, I think I probably pulled them out of this image, but it's just a really beautiful time of day to shoot. So early morning, late in the afternoon. If you want to shoot midday, um, I think that's the worst light to shoot in. But if you were going to do over-unders, specifically over-unders, it's not a bad time to shoot an over-under as midday when I mean, there's a lot of light washed over everything. But other than that, I would say that early in the morning and late in the afternoon are the best times to shoot. Guys, that is my presentation for today. If you guys have any questions about underwater photography, I have a YouTube series called The Way I See It. Um, you can subscribe there and get all kinds of tutorials and tips and tricks about underwater photography. Follow me on Instagram. I'm at Cayman Jason. And then... Come to the Cayman Islands and dive with me. I own a company here called Ambassador Divers, and we are out. We're typically out 365, seven days a week. But right now, we're on lockdown. But as soon as we open up, come dive with us here on the Cayman Islands and Ambassador Divers. We do have one last question, Jason. Um, we noticed from your YouTube videos that you recommend Canon. Can you tell us why? Um, I think it goes back to the earlier question about the Sony uh, color science, about the overly magenta color profile. Um, Canon has by far the best color science for underwater. Um, now, there will probably be some people out there in the world that would want to maybe push back against that if they're topside photographers. I'm speaking about underwater specifically. The blue color, we, all, we must remember that we're, when we're diving, we're surrounded by this incredible medium um, you know, our planet's covered in it. And I just feel like if you can't get the blue right, then what's the point? Mm. Um, you have to start with the blue. Um, then the subject matter within the blue needs to be right. But we need to make sure that the color that we're representing in the sea is always blue. It's not overly saturated. It's not overly vibrant. It's just blue, and it's the way you see it with your eye. So always try to recreate that with your eye. And then Canon, by far, has the best color science when it comes to um, underwater photography. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jason. This has been a blast. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thank you guys for coming out and listening in. And um, I hope to see you all very soon diving on one of my boats here in the Mountains. Yeah, everybody take care out there wherever you are. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.